Welcome to a new video in my home automation series and as I said in the last video what I want to talk about in the next video which is this one is how you can download sample data in InfluxDB 2.0 so what I'm going to show you is uh, while the concept of how you can design dance sampling and how you can execute it I'm not saying that this is going to be the uh, well, the one and only video because there are two minor things which I still not sure how that works or I haven't really experimented a lot with. I'm going to talk about it in the, later in the video. But um, as you can see now, um, a, one of the dance sample tasks that I did uh, was um, sampling some data on my Mi Flora soil sensor. So this is this uh, small sensor, which actually I have one here. So it's this one that you stick in your plant and it measures uh, temperature and sunlight. And I just like to use the sunlight because it's, um, it's a data that varies a lot. So uh, with this one, I downsampled sampled that data uh, between beginning of 2017 and 18. And um, I actually created, I think one day averages here, yeah. And also another downsample sample example that I did is actually for um, a outside temperature data. And if I just go to the last seven days, and this is only running for a couple of days now. By what you can see here is the green line is the actual outside temperature reading. And then I created a, a minimum value, um, the average value and the maximum value. And you can see that uh, clearly being displayed in, on, on the graph. So the minimum value, which is this orange one, is touching the bottom of the chart and the top value is touching the top of the chart. And well, the mean is somewhere in between. So first of all, I think what um, I want to talk about is just a recap of what I mentioned already is uh, in InfluxDB 2.0, when you create a bucket, you specify a retention policy. So before you start down sampling, I think you need to think about uh, how you want to create this down sampling because uh, the way it is going to work is you down sample a data in one bucket and you are going to put it into a different bucket. And you do, you do this mostly because, as I said, the retention policy is per bucket. So let's say you have a, a bucket which uh, contains your raw data, let's say your IoT measurement, which is coming every minute or every 10 seconds. And that would have a retention policy, something like a week or a month, depending on your scenario. For me, um, my DB is that is the is the bucket for me for the raw data i mean it is set to forever at the moment because i'm still playing with it but that's your that, let's say that's your primary raw data bucket and then you would create a second bucket which can be your aggregated data i mean here i'm just going uh, calling this aggregates uh, but uh, later probably i'm going to pick a better name and because you have just only one retention policy you you might end up with multiple buckets so let's say you have your row bucket which is valid for a week and then you have uh, your first aggregation which uh, contains your daily data which is going to be uh, which have a retention policy for a year and then maybe you can even down sample that to uh, an even less frequent data that you can keep forever or maybe you can keep it for five years so i'm going to select from my main bucket and then you are, i'm going to move the aggregated values to the aggregates bucket in Influx 1.x, uh, you had something called the continuous queries. And I have to be honest, I haven't really played around with continuous queries. So I don't know an awful lot on that. But that has been replaced uh, to task in 2.0. Um, apparently, there is a migration process how 1.0 continuous queries are converted to 2.0 flux queries. But essentially, what this is, task is... Uh, is a mechanism that you can schedule a flux query on a regular basis. So let's say a daily, hourly, or every um, 11 a.m. every more every day. And without um, talking too much about the background, let's just jump right into one of my flux queries. So this is going to take the uh, sunlight data from this Mi Flora sensor, which I think I'm gathering every 15 minutes. And uh, it's just going to down sample it uh, to an hourly average. And when you create a task, you have some administration data. So you have a name and then you can specify what is the, um, what is the frequency. Uh, you can specify two different ways. So one is to use this every option. And then you define that you want to run this query every hour. And you can also specify an offset. I'm primarily using this. So if I want to 
done sample every hour, obviously the task runs every hour. If I want to create a daily sampling, I set it to one day. And according to the documentation, you also have this offset, which uh, allows you to sample data that arrives late. So maybe you have a, um, a collection system where the information comes in, in batches from a remote system, but it retains the original capture date or timestamp. So maybe you have um, data which is coming, you know, five minutes late, but with the actual timestamp. So you want to um, delay your job by five or your task by five minutes, allow this data to come in, which will post with the, you know, the, the real timestamp into the database, which could be like, you know, five or 10 minutes early. So this is what the offset is used for. I have a couple of um, sort of like reservations with this whole scheduling. First of all, the good thing about this is that when you set to let's say one hour or one day, then the system will start the job, uh, let's say if it's hourly, exactly at one hour. So if I get out of this, and here you can see that I've specified one hour and uh, independent or regardless of when I edited or saved or created the task, as you can see, the task starts uh, every hour. If you specify something like a day, which I have done for my other task, then you can see that it starts, I wanted to say that every day, but it looks like that it starts every day uh, midnight at UTC. And since I am in, in Central European time, so I'm just one hour behind, it doesn't make an awful lot of difference, especially let's say if I take the temperature averages. I mean, it doesn't really matter whether I take the cut at 1 a.m. or you know zero um, at midnight. It's not going to be a huge difference, but I have to say that I have no idea how this is going to work if uh, you live, for example, in the US, because then I guess your, your job is going to run, I don't know, 4 or 5 a.m. local time if it runs on UTC. So I'm not really sure how you can schedule the job to run midnight on your local time. And if you want some, um, irreg well, let's say, irregular start or scheduling, you can also use the cron scheduler. So this is like the Linux cron when you can specify that, uh, you know, this cron um, pattern when you want the job to start. And let's say if you have some admin uh, tasks that you want to run 11 a.m. every morning, you can use the cron, that would be easier to use. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm picking up this example because as we are going to see, uh, the task just runs a query. So if you, want, if you need a query which runs, let's say daily, but not at midnight, but like 6 a.m., you can just use the Chrome scheduler and well, you can just use a task. It doesn't have to be a done sampling task. It can be anything. And if I look at the rest of the task, you can see that it has this option uh, on the top, which gets automatically generated when you fill out this left section. And then the rest of it is just a flux query. And I'm going to jump straight in because most of the things that you see here should be familiar after my previous video. So we run a selection uh, from the database or sorry, from the bucket, and then we filter it, we specify a range, we specify an aggregate window, and this is something that we have done already. And then at the end, there is a two statement and that two statement basically writes the results into your bucket. So this is how I specify that I want my averages to be uh, written into the aggregates bucket. And a couple of differences uh, uh, that you can see here is, for example, in the range, normally you can specify a two start and a stop. If you don't specify stop, that's always the current timestamp. And here in the start, I could specify, um, you know, minus task.every, so task.every, so this is one hour. Um, I just use this, I mean, I've seen this example in other cases, because um, if you change this to, let's say, daily, um, at least your, you know, flow is going to pick up the same value that you specified here, so you don't run into the issue of um, forgetting to update these reference every places in the uh, flux query. So the start is minus one hour and the stop is now. And I specify, sorry, I filter on a um, measurement, uh, filter on a tag, another tag. And also um, this is not strictly necessary, especially in my case, because I only have one field, but I also specify what field I want to work with. So I also filter on the field, which is called a value. And I aggregate, and again, I aggregate task every, so every one hour, and I use the mean function. 
So as I said, the result of this will get written into the database. And actually, if I go uh, into the Explorer F and if I run this, of course, I can I need to replace the task every. So I replace it with one hour and I do the same here. Let me change the row view. So I get two values. The reason I'm getting two values because uh, I'm running this selection you see at, uh, what is it, 6 a.m. UTC. Um, so obviously the one day is going to cut across two days. So I have a fraction of yesterday and some parts of today as well. Uh, but normally when you schedule one, you know, let's say one hour or one day, um, sorry, I was wrong. Uh, it cuts into partially the last hour and, and the current hour. So it's only, you know, six minutes past the hour. So I don't think I have any readings for um, this hour, so this is why this is empty. So when you run it from the scheduler, as I said, the scheduler always starts uh, sharp at the hour or midnight. That makes sure that it doesn't cut into the previous day or a previous hour, so you will always end up with one single line. And the result looks like just like any of the result. It has a start and a stop. It has an underscore time, and then it has a value, and that's the average value that we are interested in. And now we run into the interesting part, which is uh, this additional statement. So this is this two function, and that basically just uh, writes the results into a new bucket. And uh, so it's pipe two, and it has a couple of parameters. As you can see, uh, even if you are writing to a bucket, which is, let's say, on a different server, or uh, then you can specify a host and a token and organization as well. You can also specify what is your time column. But uh, we have seen that the, the query automatically um, you know, creates this underscore time, which is the default field for the time. So we are going to use that. And you can also specify the tags. So I'm guessing if you want to um, ignore some of the tags you, and you have more tags, you can just uh, list the ones that you need. And you also have this function here, the field, field fn, that's not function, it's a parameter. And what I'm using is, in my case, is um, um, what we have seen just now is the actual average is going to be in the underscore value field. In my new bucket, I want this field to be called the mean, so it's not called the value. And here I'm mapping or let's say renaming the underscore value field to a field mean. And, um, and that's pretty much it. And of course, you can do a lot more complicated query. Um, especially if you have a database where you need to reference uh, multiple fields or you maybe you need to do a calculation. But, um, you know, with the examples that I have, which is mostly like, you know, simple IoT data where you want to just create averages or last or minimum maximum values, I think that's pretty much it. This is what you would need to do in most cases. And I've created a few other queries as well. So if I go back to my tasks, um, I also created this um, down sampling example where it runs through a temperature sensor. It gets the value just like the for the Miflora sensor and it aggregates it. Uh, I'm running this daily and I'm also using the mean and I'm calling the new value average. And uh, I also wanted to get the daily maximum temperature. And as you can see, it runs the same thing in the aggregate window. I'm using the function max and I'm calling the new field max. And this is executed daily, so you can see that uh, the timestamps here, which are exactly midnight, and the same for the min. So the aggregation function is minimum, and then the field is also called the, the min. And if I go to my explorer now and see how this works, so let me just switch back to the query builder. So aggregates, I still use the sensor measurement, and I, if I want to use the new Flora device and the sensor, now you can see that the field is called the mean. And yeah, that's the mean data. And if I switch over to the weather station, I have temperature and I have average max and min. So this is how that looks like. I just need to switch to the last seven days. So this query is only running for a past few days. So I only have a, a few measurements. And this is what you can see in Grafana as well. One other thing I want to highlight here is the last time. Oh, let me change the row view. 
So the last time this job has executed was actually midnight today. And if I go all the way back to the database, uh, sorry, the last record, you can see that today is the 20th of December. I just needed to lower the blinds because the sun is coming up. So if I change, uh, switch the row view, and then you will notice that the timestamp for each of these average measurements, so the last one was uh, taken today, it's actually today's date. And uh, for some reason it says, uh, you know, 30 minutes past the past midnight. Uh, so this is the other thing I haven't really figured out how to change. I mean, it really depends on your uh, on your preference, but uh, for me it would make sense if the if the day or the date for the average would point to the day that I am averaging on. So now the the time or the timestamp for the average picks up the end of the period and not to the beginning of the period. So if I want to display this in the uh, uh, in Grafana, then you're going to see that uh, the average always trails the actual measurement. So here, this is my maximum here, and actually you know, the maximum of the reading is before that. And the reason these maximums don't match because uh, even this view is, is creating an average. So if I go into the configuration and if I change the period to let's say one minute the aggregation period now you can see that we have all the data and you can actually see the peak which matches that peak so um i mean this is something that um, it annoys me a bit and i ideally i would like to reset this timestamp to one day before because i think it would make more sense for me and uh, this is why i like to um, visualize this information in grafana because as you can see in Grafana, that shows correctly, but that's only because Grafana have this option here in the settings that if I go down, you can have this line interpolation and you have this option to step before. So the way it steps the graph will mean that it would actually, you know, match the, you know, what you see on the screen and what you expect the sort of your average values to be. And by the way, to make this uh, graph work in Grafana, I had to create a mix query where you can mix data sources because I usually create my data sources per bucket. So uh, the, the main data, the green chart, comes from my DB bucket. And then the other two charts, the other two colors, are coming from the aggregates bucket. And as you can see, I just filtered on the uh, uh, the measurement and the tags, nothing special. And of course on the field. Here you have to, um, you know, filter on the field because, uh, you know, with these, in this measurement and with these tags, you actually have three fields. So here I had to use the uh, field filter as well. But this is how you make this, uh, how you visualize this data in uh, Grafana and also in InfluxDB. So as I've shown you before, uh, just like with regular flux queries, you can also use the data explorer to get the get to the information that you need. So if I go back to my source data and I select my measurement and I start filtering on my tags. So for example, if I want to average my humidity readings, you can just uh, submit, use the query builder to build the query just to you know filter the data that you need. And if you switch over to the script editor, it's going to contain everything that you need. So you have the you know, the from the range, all the filters down to your measurement, the tags and your field. And it all even um, includes the aggregate window. And uh, at the end, there is always this yield parameter that gets added and we can just ignore that. So we can just copy and paste this. And if I go back to the task, I can easily clone one of my existing tasks. And here I can replace everything with you know, my new selection that I copied from the uh, uh, Data Explorer and I can just replace the range with minus ev task every and also the period window with minus task every and at the end I just need to add the two functions so it writes the result data into a new bucket. And that's pretty much it. I mean, the type of aggregation that I'm doing here 
this is all I need to do. And if you are doing this for the first time, I would encourage you to just basically keep trying, just create a new bucket and then uh, set up this task and let them run for an, a couple of days or a couple of hours, depending on what is the frequency and uh, see what type of data it generates. Because as I mentioned in my previous video, you can easily delete data from your database. So what I've been doing even in the past is I you know, started creating all these aggregates and if something didn't work or the timestamp was off or I was scheduling it the wrong time, I can just issue a delete command. So if you go log back into your server, you can just do influx delete and dash dash the bucket. So in my case aggregates and you can pick a start and a stop time, which is a reasonably large window and that would just delete everything from the database. Or you can also add some parameters uh, where you can filter on measurements and uh, tags and again, a timestamp, and that would get deleted from the database. So I think this is an easy way to get started and uh, basically make changes. If you don't like, you just delete them and then you try again. And at this point, I also want to show you another basically trick. So, um, you know, what I, mentioned right in the beginning is tasks are just queries that get executed on a regular basis and with the two function we ensure that the result of the query is not lost it just you know written into the database but uh, it's not only the two function that you can use for example there is a function which is called the mqtt which would let you send the result in an mqtt message so let's say you can create an average reading for the last hour, you send it off to MQTT, you pick up that MQTT topic in Home Assistant and you can just put the value into your Home Assistant dashboard. And you could do the same in task. I mean, obviously it's not going to downsample the data, it's just going to run a query and then send the result into MQTT. So you can use tasks for that. It can be literally used for any reoccurring activities where you want to execute a Flux query. But the other thing I wanted to show you is uh, if I go back to my aggregates data and if I go back to my device and sensor. So if I run the selection and if I pick a very large time scale and actually I want to go back to 2016. Then you see that I have a lot of data in 2017, basically starting 1st of January 2017 all the way until the last day of 2017 and I have nothing and I have a couple of uh, days worth of data which I which the task generated that we have just seen and what I want to show you is that you can um, use the data explorer to uh, create a done sample data for your historical records because all it takes is just you know running a flux query and you can run a flux query in the data explorer and in order to generate this set of data for 2017 I have executed this command, which as you can see, it looks exactly like the what, you, what we have configured in the task. The only difference is that I have specified a fixed time range. So if I go back to my script editor, and if I replace that, as you can see, it still has the two, the aggregation window by one hour, sorry, one day. Uh, okay, here I'm doing a daily average, it's not hourly average, but it's, it's pretty much the same and I specified a full year here in the start and the stop. And that basically would, you know, select the all the data for that year and it would generate a daily average, which is going to be you know, loads of records and it saves it in the database. So we can do that now and we are going to do that with 2018. So I'm selecting a start date from beginning of 2018 to the beginning of 2019 and I just run submit and you will notice that it's going to run for a couple of seconds because it's selecting all this data. Uh, well, actually, it took much less than I expected. And if I uh, apply the filter, so if I go back to the query builder, and if I start selecting the, um, restoring my selection, fields, average, and if I run this from 2016 to today, let me change the um, aggregation window so we can see all the details here. Now you can see that I have the data for 2017 and I also have the data for 2019 as well. I wanted to show you this because uh, especially if you, you know, if you start with influx, but you already have some data, you can just easily regenerate the data. So what I would suggest is you create your tasks, 
and then make sure that the tasks are running. So the task will start generating the data on a, let's say on a daily or an hourly basis, starting from, from the time whenever you created the, uh, the task. And if everything looks good, you can just create a query or a flux query just like this, where you select a range for all the host historical records in the database, and you can just generate your historical done sample data with a single click. And before I let you go, I wanted to show you something else uh, where you can find a lot of uh, really good resources. So there is a GitHub page with influx data slash community dash templates. And uh, you find a lot of stuff here on how you can use, for example, Grafana and InfluxDB to collect data from various, uh, um, let's say, servers and databases. But there is a directory here, which is called the Dance Sampling. And that contains a lot of uh, interesting um, information and resources on how you do Dance Sampling. And one thing that I specifically find very useful, if you just open any of them, because they pretty much uh, tend to work on the same uh, example, is, is actually this one. So I haven't shown you in my example, but in, in Flux, you can also create databases. So let's say you want to, um, you have a database which has a measure, sorry, you have a bucket which has a measurement, and in that measurement, you ha it has a lot of different tags and fields, and you probably want to do done sampling based on multiple of these fields. So what you can do is you can write your initial query on the top, which is going to be like, you know, from, and then you run the range, and then you filter, let's say you just filter on the measurement, and then you actually put it into a variable, so all data. And then you can reference to that all data, and you can start a new part in your InfluxDB. So um, if you remember in my previous Influx video, I said that this pipe basically says that whatever is returned by the row above gets piped into this statement. So normally we are using the from bucket uh, to uh, get our initial selection, but in this case, our initial selection is not a from bucket, but it's the data set that we have already defined in the top. So in this case, it's uh, running an all data, and then it is further getting filtered and the result goes into like a numeric, numeric data. And then you can just reference to that numeric data and then, you know, create an aggregate function on a key and put it into a bucket. And then maybe you can again create another aggregate function, again select a key, and then you can put it into a bucket. So you can just save uh, space by not defining, well, save time and also not defining your entire flux query. You just, uh, you know, uh, do the skeleton and then you put it into a variable and then start using that variable to filter it down, put it into aggregate window, and then um, put it into a database. And as you can see in this example, you can do, you know, multiple of these in a single flux query or in a single task. And that is, um, I think it's just probably going to help you just to organize your tasks better. Because if you have, you know, a few dozens of um, measurements that you want to downsample, sample, I think it would be much easier to manage it in a one task which has you know loads of these examples than to create one uh, individually for you know each of your let's say each of your values like i did in my example so probably i also want to rework that example and uh, change it to something else and then you can find the loads of information here i mean most of it is telegram related but still just by going through a couple of them i think it's going to be very useful I mean, this seems to be the same. That's an interesting resource. So just look at these community templates because I think it's going to be useful. So I think that's all going to be for today about uh, done sampling data. And hopefully I'm going to be releasing more InfluxDB videos in the near future, but I really wanted to get this uh, section out. So that would be all for today. Thanks for watching and hopefully see you in the next video.